Great, thanks everyone. I was going to sit here, and, but I can't see this side of the audience. So um, I'll turn it over to you guys first. Um, any questions for the panelists as you think through your own strategies? Or Yes. Uh, so, Charles Watkinson, University of Michigan, right? Um, Should we run you the mic? Yeah, let me go. Uh, so, Charles Watkinson. Um, so, it's come up a couple of times this uh, question of the adoptable book, right? So, um, the thing that gets picked up by a course, especially if it's a, a thing that's a scholarly monograph. Um, on the outside, and then it suddenly gets success. Um, and maybe it's a particular question for Vivian, which is how do you manage relationships with you internally in your organization? Because the problem that I have is my editors bring this up every week. Like, we're giving away the farm um, by making these unlimited. And um, I just wonder about sort of this internal management of expectations within your organization. Um, good. Is it on? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh yeah, there we are. Um, I'm the boss. I just say that goes my way. <laughs> um, I, no, there is actually discussions that happen, and I think it's. I mean, a lot of them too. I think the question is, um, how is that title performing? What you know, we're, we're prepared to sort of hold some books back, but ultimately we sort of decided. The overall, so it was a risk analysis basically, so we sort of decided that putting out all our books is unlimited um, and that the benefit of the overall across all of our markets would outweigh those few smaller text adoptions, ultimately. I mean, that's where we are and that's, uh, in one year that might change, but I mean, it, it was very challenging. Um, yeah, because as it's often it's just some, as you know, some books suddenly get adopted five years later. I mean, it's amazing what some of the details that these books have. Um, and so I don't know also from, I mean, in a way, so then my question is maybe to the librarians. I guess in an ideal world, we would then want to flip it off very, very quickly um, and, and sort of go with that. But I don't know what that then does for the, li you know, are we withdrawing it? Are we ch just flipping off the mod, you know, f changing the model? Um, but yeah, I mean, we basically decided that for the time being, we were just taking a much bigger approach because we decided that it was doing more damage not to have that wider discoverability and those sales that were coming in than um, going this other way. And, and ultimately also, as you can see in the end, the single, many of these libraries are buying single user anyway. Um, and I will also add what it has done for us is it's actually been a very useful author relations um, tool in that our books are generally coming out. We do very few split binds, so we're generally coming out with the expensive hardback. And one of the biggest conversations you all have is, you know, we probably all have who don't do split binds regularly is when is my paperback coming out, my students can't afford it. And so what we've now started saying to them is, well, you know, you can actually go to your librarian, get them to have the unlimited version, and that way everyone in your class can access it. And this is ultimately, and, and from an author's perspective, this is, they're excited to hear this. Um, does that mean we would have, you know, in three years when we would bring out a paperback, we'll have lost those? I, I mean, I don't know, maybe there's still a few print copies, but students aren't buying books anyway, let's be honest, right? So the, what are we really losing? So I think from an author relations perspective, it was um, also an important thing that just by chance to chatting with authors at, you know, at conferences and this sort of thing. So it's helping us get usability and, and get the book out there to students, which is also an important role that we play, and it removes that barrier for them. And in a way, I feel like that could be an, an interesting way to think about more generally um, how to get our books into students' hands given that they don't have the money to buy books anymore. So, yeah, long answer, sorry. <laughs> Any other publishers in the audience want to comment on how they decide what to put in the unlimited user model and what to withhold? This is a question that we talked about as a panel and thought would be something worth discussing. 
it's okay if not. Um, some of the research that EBSCO has done recently about, as we've been thinking about, are we going to cannibalize other revenue streams for publishers, and are we shooting ourselves in the foot as aggregators? Um, we've seen a strong desire from both libraries and end users to have both the ebook and the print book. And I'm sort of putting Allison on the spot a little bit, but she did talk to me about a small scale study, I think at UNC, at UNC. Um, that if you could share that, I think it's really interesting for a publishing audience. With the bookstore? With, With the bookstore, yes. yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was thinking of this actually while Vivian was responding earlier. We, we were in a very lucky position. Even though we had a Barnes & Noble bookstore, we had uh, someone on the inside. The, their assistant manager was a librarian, and so he was willing to l share with us a great deal more data than I think his corporate overlords would have liked. Um, we were able to partner with them to actually market on the bookstore shelves when we had an unlimited user copy of an adopted textbook. So we had a list of maybe 60 books total that were available, and they let us advertise with little you know, shelf cards for 25 of them. And then they shared with us both what they, how many they purchased, what the course enrollment was, so what they thought they would sell to a classroom of, of 100 students. Um, what they bought, what they thought they would sell, and what they actually sold. And we really didn't see a, a strong effect. There, there were maybe a couple of classes where they did not hit their targets at all, but there were several where they hit or exceeded their targets. And again, you know, we could also see what was a used book sale, and we could see, okay, there were 150 students in that section and you only bought 30 copies of the book. Is that, are, are we the problem here? <laughs> So, but it was really, it was interesting to see that even with the obvious option of a book that you've already paid for through the library, I don't like calling them free books through the library, I like reminding them, that they were still willing to buy the books for different reasons. And so we did a survey of the students who were in those 25 books courses at the end of the year to see, okay, did you know? <laughs> did you see the sticker? Did you hear in class? Um, and if you knew, what did you do? Did you buy the book? Did you print the book? Did you read the book online? Did you ignore the book completely? We got a lot of really interesting feedback from the students. They are all over the place with what they are doing or not doing with their textbooks. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, Robert? Um, the mic. Right down here. I, was, I was just responding to Kara's last question. So it's not really a question I'm going to have, it's just a, an observation about how an, another publisher, in this case the American Mathematical Society, went about thinking about DRMs. So actually for many years we've had collections uh, for libraries of ebooks um, with DR, DRM free mark records um, and perpetual access and that's been on our own platform, that's been quite successful. But then, and that's you know, we've now got pretty much all of our, our books up in those collections. We had, or we'll have, around 3,000 plus books in print. And we have a front list of around 100 books a year at this point. Um, then came the, 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 you know, what do we do with books if we want to sell them to individuals? <laughs> and you can imagine the battle that we had. I won, and we went DRM free. Um, but we went through quite the process of looking at various different vendors. Could we apply technical Adobe DRM to those books or not? And in the end, we went with what you guys have really been talking about, which is you know, just really making life as easy as possible. And, the, and we do make people feel guilty, which I'm particularly good at doing. Um, and on there, we just sort of say, please do not share. If you see anything being shared, report it. And you're, doing, you're buying this book as a, as a part of the mission of our society. Um, but we, have, we don't really hold books back. And we, we reckoned a little bit like, I think, I think it was Vivian, you were saying that in the overall effect is one that we've seen an increase in sales all around. There may be some decrease in the textbook side, but, there, but some of our more esoteric books have actually gone up in sales because you know, nobody was aware of them, I think, before. So it's been a really strong success. We still see some decline in print sales, though mathematicians love their print. Um, it's part of the way they work. So I, sorry, that wasn't a question, it was a rant, but it was, I just thought I'd make that another, a different type of observation from the world of mathematics. 
I think in general, when you think about scholarly publishing versus true course-adopted textbook publishing that's pedagogical, you can't, as a scholarly publisher, account for every possible use case that's going to come up for, the, for that title. Because for our research publishing program, we've got a small number of books that we would consider textbooks, and I'm putting them in quotes, but really they're still research and they're being used by PhD level students, not undergrads. So the course adoptions, first of all, are much smaller if they are adopted at all, and they're probably secondary or tertiary recommended reading titles. They're not required reading titles for courses. So the, the vastness in potential for individual ebook sales when you're talking about those different size of classes or recommended versus required, you can't, you can't make a decision based on the potential risk of losing the sales to an individual student through a bookstore who may or may not purchase it anyway because it's used or they're just not gonna buy it. So I think your point is so valid that you have to make the decision for what's best for your overall business and where you intend for that book to live um, and then deal with the repercussions of it and we can't, you know, we can't account for every potential fallout from that. And I think in a follow-up to that also, when it comes to then how to talk to your editors about that, I suppose it's also then trying to get them to think a little bit more globally also and to sort of try to, I mean, obviously, I think, when, especially when there are certain books and there are very certain classes, which means a very certain set of universities that they would be targeting, um, which is then quite a sort of micro approach and to sort of think about, and that's what we then sort of ultimately have done, is look at the pros and cons and, and try to then have them step back and then and, and take this much more global approach, which often I think some editors do tend to then start to focus on their very, their core discipline, well, as they're supposed to, of course, but, but in terms of they become a little sort of blinkered, and so this is a great opportunity to help them think about these larger um, regions and also as, a, you know, models and the ways that it's a great way to get actually into these community colleges, let's say, that you would otherwise never get into, at least we would otherwise ne never get into. Hi. Um, I was curious, obviously, as you guys have mentioned, um, download restrictions are probably not received very well. But I was curious if you had any specific data or even just anecdotal accounts of how users respond to browser-based reading experiences as opposed to um, maybe downloading the entire book or, you know, even in terms of just standardizing the reading experience across formats, if that's, you know, palatable enough or if there are web-based tools that they can use, if that's sort of a viable alternative to maybe a full book download. I mean, my first response to that is that this kind of falls into Emily's point about what hoops they're willing to jump through. There are certain books that browser-based would be good enough, right, where they, they really want to read it and that's okay. Um, but it's not the norm, I think. Uh, I think that for, for my experience, typically, the offline option is pretty important. And if we don't have it provided, it's going back to those hoops, you know, they're, they're going to jump through hoops, but they're not going to be our hoops anymore. <laughs> they're, they're, they're going to be uh, maybe converting the files. Maybe, maybe we didn't make a file that was downloadable, but they know a way to do that. The, the, yeah, choosing the way that they get there, um, we only have one shot at that. <laughs> and if we make it too hard to do, they'll, they'll figure out something that we may not be happy with at all. <laughs> And something I can add to that is that I did some user testing with my colleague Dave Como looking at different um, DRM free ebook platforms. And so some of them would have a, a web based version of the ebook and then also a downloadable version. Um, and we had them do a series of like tests with the series of activities. It was very interesting because it seemed like, you know, the, the more noticeable one was usually the web-based version, and so that was where a lot of students would go, and then they would have a, a hard time doing the tasks, and if we kind of redirected them and pointed them to the downloadable version, then they've all, like, everybody's... Um, you know, interacted with a PDF before. Actually, surprisingly, very few knew that you could do a control F and find a keyword. We would tell them about this, and they'd be like, why didn't I know about this earlier in my, in my college career? I would have saved so much time. But, you know, um, still, they, they were able to complete tasks more easily in the PDF. But it was surprising that 
students would go, they would, you know, um, focus on one thing and it would be the web-based version and then they would sometimes struggle. So more options are not always better, I guess. Yeah, that echoes just what we've seen um, from the aggregator perspective in some of our user research and user testing. We obviously have the online platform, but users want to take it and bring it home with them, put it into their own system and annotate with their own tools. And even though we offer those kinds of notes, et cetera, um, they want the control and the convenience of downloading it. And when there are, when the chapter is like five pages longer than their download allowance, it's like mind-numbingly frustrating, right? So um, that's also what we mm -hmm. found. I just want to check the time here. We're just about out of time, but any other questions? platform tools, ways of presenting books that are really digging into disciplines in that way, really getting beyond the uh, e-book uh, annotation tools and all those basic cross-discipline things. Yeah, so um, Novel, the platform that you're referring to, is an engineering work, we call it a workflow solution. Um, so it's it's rooted in ebooks, um, and it sits kind of parallel to ScienceDruck. We acquired it probably three or four years ago. Um, it's probably a third science, uh, third Elsevier content, but it's an aggregated platform, so there's dozens of publishers on there. I don't know the exact number. Um, but they take the book content. Um, a lot of the books are also on Science Direct, but then they add um, interactive tools and things like that. So if it's an engineering book and there's, um, I don't know the terminology, but you can kind of play with the data that's within the book and make it unique to what you're working on as opposed to just a static um, piece of content that you're reading on a PDF page. We actually see that in the academic community a lot. Um, I expected when we brought it on for it to be a corporate R&D solution, but it's used a lot in the academic community, far more than I would have expected it to, um, just given what it, what it does and kind of you know its, its intended use case. I don't know if you guys are seeing anything else interesting from other provide under other vendors. I see. Um, so I, with Novel, certainly our students like that you can search tables and things like that. That they're not just static PDFs. It makes the information much more findable. But I guess it, when I think about um, most of the the vendors that have added something to the ebook experience, those oftentimes I associate with an ebook with DRM, and so the ebook vendors that it isn't DRM, it's usually just a PDF. And so then what I see that students like the most are, is when there's both the chapter by chapter download option and the whole book option. I know I was just saying that more options aren't always better, <laughs> but that is actually something that I find that students really like because sometimes they only need a chapter's worth of content and so it feels like such a labor to have to get the whole book and seek it out and other times they want the whole book and so to have everything be at the chapter level is really a barrier. If there's time, I, I can also just say that I think with novel in particular, it's the discipline that makes it successful, right? That an engineering class can have enough breadth of coverage on a single platform that they won't feel like frustrated that they can't do the cool thing with the other book they need to. They can live there. You know, I now work at a small liberal arts college and our work is so interdisciplinary. Having all those cool features would only actually be cool if we could pull all the content we wanted, any of the content we wanted in and have it be our own little sandbox yeah. that we compose. We're, we're very special now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good feedback. Well, thank you to our panelists and thanks everyone for joining us and enjoy your evening.